All right. So thank you, and for the sorry about the delay. Um, so thank you for time for the for the invite. So this work was um, a collaboration between um, my group at McGill and um, a company called the name of um, Numabio. So some of the work will be done purely by my group. Some of it is with Numabio. Um, to give a brief overview, what my group does is we build nanofluidic. Sorry, need to take off math. Nanofluidic devices to analyze single molecules. So these are devices which consist of nanopores and nanochannels, dimensions between one to several hundred nanometers. And my group sort of has three different sort of objectives within this rubric. We have, we develop new types of nanofluidic devices and new nanofabrication technologies. We apply these technologies to applications in the biology, particularly direct analysis of single molecules, single biomolecules. And also we, single molecule analysis has the advantage that you can avoid amplification and you avoid averaging. So you can see this for the heterogeneity at the, at, the, at the single molecule level. Finally, we apply our technology to physics problems, so now we can find soft matter. I sort of like these three because it creates a nice interplay, of course. And the questions in the physics are how does nano confinement alter macromolecular behavior? And then can we use nanofluidics to model confinement in biology? And this is sort of a nice interplay between these three categories. Of course, developing new devices leads to new applications. And, but new devices can also lead to new ways to explore um, confinement physics. And finally, if you understand the confinement physics well, we can use that to optimize device performance and improve the applications. And so I'm gonna talk three um, things that today. Um, develop of a new technology to make nanopores in collaboration with Peter Gruder. Um, a techno technology we've been developing with NubaBio. And finally, to, to create kind of active control using dual pore devices. And finally, a problem involving exploring organization of multiple chains in little confined um, boxes. And that's with a professor in biology at Miguel um, Rodrigo Reyes Lamov. So I'm going to begin with some sort of background in sort of pore sort of field, because I'm probably this community isn't really aware of that. Um, so, what is a nanopore? Well, it's a small hole in the membrane. I put that membrane between two buffer reservoirs, and I apply a voltage drop across the pore that creates an electric field which starts driving molecules through the pore. Um, when the molecules pass through, they increase the resistance transiently and create a dip in the current. They can use it as a detector. There are two types of pores in the field. There's what they call solid state pores. These are pores which are in machine synthetic materials like silicon nitride, like oxide, like, um, like two-dimensional nanomaterials, like graphene. And also there's a second class of pores which are given to us by biology. Biological pores, these are transmembrane pores that sit in a lipid bilayer. And the community is split between these two um, areas. It's important to understand. The, um, the protein pores are nice because their dimensions are really tiny. The, the MSPF is at 1.2 nanometer, the smallest aperture. Alpha hemolysis is a sparrow, about 2.6 nanometers. And of course, biology ensures these things always self assemble identically. However, I can't make these pores larger. So there's a certain small constrained size range. Um, you probably heard about nanopore sequencing, and it's important to make clear that protein pores can sequence, while solid state pores cannot yet. And so you might wonder, well, why is the community still interested in working with solid state pores? Well, the answer is that potentially you could have higher sensing resolution in a solid state pore, potentially. That's because in a protein pore, really, even though the, the, the apertures are very small, they still get actual signals from about three to five nucleotides at once. So they don't truly have single nucleotide resolution. They're really measuring blocks of three to five. And that creates complications in the way you actually analyze the data. So they're really great, maybe using two-dimensional nanomaterials to create a pore with real single nucleotide resolution. The key reason for this talk will be that you can make solid state pores with much more flexible dimensions, bigger. Why is that important? So you can look at other biological entities, not just DNA, but proteins, proteins bound in DNA, for example. And finally, you would potentially have greater integration um, scalability with solid state pores. I can just make them directly onto CMOS electronics, for example. But ultimately, you could have much cheaper. Um... So, the key application for this talk is not sequencing. It's important to make that very clear. What we're doing is a type of mapping application. What we're going to be focusing on is mapping probes bound to a DNA channel came through a pore. And we can think of these as little physical bumps along the molecule. And what happens is when these, the, this labeled DNA goes to the pore and you look at the current, what you do is you get the actual um, DNA blockade here, but you also see the physical bumps on top of the DNA blockade. And you can use these bumps to pinpoint the location of the probes as a molecule goes through the, through the pore. Now, how do we make these, these probes? Well, 
What we're doing, they're sequence specific and they're binding to a, a fixed repetitive sequence motif through the molecule of interest. And this is typically done through something called a nicking enzyme, which creates a single strand of nick at a given um, motif. There's a whole library of these guys you can buy that hit specific sequences. And what you do is you basically create a barcode along the DNA. We actually end up labeling like a protein, in this case, milestone of avidin, to the actual nick sites. And that's how it's done. So we're basically thinking like a, a series of bumps go through the port, creating a physical barcode. Now that's mapping. It gives us sort of coarse grain information on sequence. It's not as interesting nowadays because this is purely electrical, no optics involved. It's sitting in a little tiny little USB key sitting on your computer. It's a very, very small footprint. But really, there's a lot of pressure on pure mapping applications given the sequence potential of pores. So that's sort of the long range idea is we really want to combine two types of information. We want to have a second type of probe, which might be generic by, for example, target functional information, like epigenetic related information, on top of our sequence probes, which you call the scaffold. And now, if we can distinguish these two types of probes, we can scaffold sequence probes to align this fragment to the genome and then incorporate this sort of this functional information as a kind of annotation on the genome. And that's ultimately where we want to go. I should mention that the solid state pore community is not as focused on these real core applications you might expect. They tend to be very focused on construct work. They don't tend to think genome scale, which is really a surprise to me, but that's how the community thinks. So the first part, the first topic will be how do we actually make solid state pores? Well, there, there's a classic technique going back 20 years in the field is to use things like um, energetic particles like ion beams or electrons. For example, you take a membrane, you put it in a transmission electron microscope, you focus the beam, you can make a pore, and you can make it where you want. That's great, but there's some obvious limitations. Lowered the low yield. These are very expensive instruments that sit in clean room facilities. You know, TM is a million bucks of instrument. So they're, they're, and, and they use high va vacuum conditions. So for that reason, um, the Tavar Kasa group at all was developed a nice method where it's really simple. Any group can apply it. You just take your, your, your nitrine membrane, you, you stick it in a little cell, you apply a voltage, and, and, and what Tavar Kasa group found out was that a very high voltage can actually create a pore via dielectric breakdown. And that's a great method because it's really, you know, any, any lab can do it. You don't need fancy, fancy equipment. However, it has a real drawback in that the pores are randomly located. They're made at some random weak position on the membrane, some major defect that just leads to a pore when you sort of blanket apply a voltage across the membrane. And another problem that people don't talk about often is that this technique has a disadvantage that it can produce multiple pores instead of one. It's a huge problem because it creates a lot of noise, um, reduces your signal. A noise level, and it can't produce pore of it. What if I want to make more than one pore? Well, if I make one pore, I should I make another? All the currents could get dumped in the pore I make. So it can't produce more than one. So for that reason, collaboration with, with Peter, we've developed a, a sort of a new way of applying breakdown using a conductive AFM tip. So imagine we have a conductive AFM tip. We bring it down onto a membrane. We lower it. We apply about one um, nanometer of force to get good electrical contact. And then we apply a voltage locally at the tip. And then that, we create a pore at that position due to local breakdown. And we move the tip upwards, we retract it, and we can then make another pore. A great technique because we can make as many as we want in principle on a membrane. Um, I should point out that the real driving thing that really makes this technology work well is using very special conductive diamond tips from, from a company called Adama, I should mention. So, so what? What, what, what happens when we actually lower the tip and apply a voltage? Well, we apply these voltages in a square pulse with a certain duration, a certain amplitude. And then if we measure the current of the tip, we get a signal that looks like this. Initially, when we apply the voltage, we don't see a current. We see a very, very small current here. And then oh, at, after a certain breakdown time, TBD, we suddenly get this rapid rise in the current that signals the formation of a pore. The current plateaus. This is because we have the simple thing. We add a resistor in series, a 10 gigaohm resistor in series with the actual tip. And that limits the current you can apply. When the, the, when the pore starts growing, its resistance falls. And then all the resistance, the voltage gets dropped across our shunt resistor. And that, that, that levels off the current. And then we the pulse ends. And then you get our CPK. And so the nice thing about it is, well, that signals we should have made a pore. Now, OK, you may wonder, did you really make a pore there? How do you know? Well, what we can do is we can take this pore from the AFM setup, and then we can transfer it to a cell containing a one molar um, potassium chloride, your standard, um, your, your, your translocation buffer. And then we can measure the IV curve. We get a nice linear IV curve, so there's nothing funky about a pore there. And then the IV curve, that, that we can take the resistance from that, and that gives a measure of the pore diameter. What people in the community do is they basically assume the pore has a cylindrical diameter. 
They assume a kind of inlet um, resistance factor here, and you can use this formula to back out an estimate of the actual pore sign. In this case, for a thick, nice way thickness about 10 nanometers, you get a 10 nanometer pore. So that suggests we do have a pore. Well, maybe you don't believe it. So we add DNA to our cell. This is just a kind of a ladder, nothing particularly fancy. And what we do is we, we look at, we get these classic sort of blockade signatures um, in our experiment, like here. And if you look at, if you zoom up on these things, you see the classic signatures of folding. This would represent a linearized translocation. This is a translocation with a, with a fold. You see the two levels. The, the fold creates a sort of doubles the, the current level. And then you get, this is a double folded. So, and if you histogram this thing, you'll see these peaks corresponding to the different, you know, the, the, the linear translocation folded, et cetera. Nothing fancy about this data. It's been, de been developed 20, you know, been just classic data people obtained first, I think 2001, but showing us likely we have pores. This is a sense you'd expect for about 10 nanometer pore. Finally, the classic test is TCM. We make an array of pores with, with our with TCLB. Do we see the pores? Yeah, this is a TCM of, of, of a um, three by three array. This shows you a four nanometer pore. And this shows you some other examples. The pore sizes range from about two to four nanometers. Our techniques who are really are making sub five nanometer pores. I'd say really careful control of the diameter is something we're still working on at this level. But our applications are actually focusing on larger pores. And to make them larger, you can simply increase the duration of the pulse, or you can simply apply an electric field, high electric field, when the pore is actually set up in your, in your, in your TCL cell. And so, and so you, can, you can actually enlarge them. There are reproducible strategies for doing so. Um, so our technique is kind of nice because we can make an array of pores and that allows us to actually vary the fabrication condition. So for example, this shows you a, um, this row is at 15 volts we apply, this is 14, 13, 12. And then for each point in this array, we can actually get the, um, it's a big image, there we go. These are the actual signatures of pore, um, but this is the voltage amplitude, you see it's growing across the array. This shows you the actual breakthrough events. Note that not all the voltages lead to a pore forming. Only the highest voltages, 15 and 14, do. In particular, um, the, 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 when they're white, you see this actually in, indicates a successful pore is formed. And so it seems there's sort of a voltage threshold at pore formation. Another interesting question, too, is um, this breakdown time and what's controlling that here. So what we did is we did a sort of a more detailed analysis. What? Oh. So we looked at the statistics of that breakdown time. Um, if you look at classic um, dielectric breakdown technique, um, the actual distribution of that breakdown time should satisfy something called a Weibull, which is a type of extreme value distribution, which is often used to model failure statistics in semiconductors. And what we then did, we basically look at the cumulative distribution of our data, and we, we plotted that cumulative distribution so that if it really fit a Weibull, it would be, it would be linear. But however, if you look at this, it's not linear. So our data, our breakdown distribution is not a good fit to this classic Weibull distribution, which is kind of interesting because that's what you'd expect for the classic breakdown where you don't have the local electric field apply. What we actually found is our data is better described by a long normal. And this is suggesting that, note that the Weibull is actually classic distribution for a weakest link. If you have a sort of statistics where there's like a lot of possible failure mechanisms, but one weak link, the Weibull will be the correct one but we don't see the Weibull. So this is indicative that our, our, our local probe, which is just looking at the generic properties of the membrane, um, is not, it's really not a weakest link failure mechanism. So a little bit further about this. In particular, we look at the breakdown probability as a function of voltage. And this shows that for two um, nitride thicknesses, this is around 12 to 14, this is 20. We, we, as, as you expected from the raw data, we get these rapid sort of thresholds at which pores are formed around you know, 13 volts for the 10, 12, 14, about 20, Two for the um, for the plain nanometer nitride. So this is nice. Basically, we can ensure that pores are formed reproducibly at a critical voltage. Um, we also look at the mean breakdown time as a function of voltage, and we saw that this is really a nice fits nicely to a decaying exponential. This is a semi-log. This nice line here. Um, the logarithm of the um, this breakdown time is proportional to the um, the the electric field here. Um, and this is interesting. This is indicative of a kind of physics known as the E model of people who look at time dependent breakdown. And this arises, people speculate, from a dipolar coupling between the electric field and defects within the material. For example, you might have bonds that are slightly strained from the equilibrium angle. You apply this field, those strained bonds only start acquiring a dipole moment. That's thing like that. um, And when the energy is lowered, then it takes a lower thermal excitation to actually break. 
So you have this combination of a sort of thermal excitation plus a sort of Doppler coupling, which is at the heart of this particular physics. Finally, um, I'd like to know from an application's point of view, this tip controlled local breakdown, it's really fast. So this is what you get from classic elect breakdown. And this is our um, time scale for forming a pore, 10 milliseconds, one second, 100, we get, we get two orders of magnitude faster than, 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 than the classic breakdown, which is pretty nice. Um, what this means is that the time to actually form an array is dominated by the time it takes to move the AFM tip. In particular, it takes about 25 minutes to make 400 pores, so about 16 pores per minute. So that's the, this pore fabrication technique. Now I'm going to move on to discuss sort of a more of an application of pores. Um, and this is in collaboration with this with Duma Bio, where the, basically it's led by um, the CEO of that company, Bill, Bill Dunbar. So basically, Controlling translocation is a major problem in the pore. Um, even though those protein pores are nanometric dimensions, you cannot use them to sequence unless you add a special ingredient to the mix. And this is to have a molecular machine known as a, uh, otherwise known as a polymerase control the translocation to the protein pore. It turns out with these polymerase controlled translocations, you can actually get about 10 milliseconds um, per step. So something like a, a four order of magnitude slowdown from the actual translocation you get in the absence of the protein. Well, that's great. Biology gives us these things to us on a plate. But what about solid state pores? Well, I can't do this yet with solid state pores. I, don't, I can't couple yet some polymerase, so I can't build some sort of rasping mechanism yet that's completely synthetic or artificial. So therefore, the translocation is, is uncontrolled in a solid state pore. And this is a lot of problematic limitations for technologies. Of course, the translocation is too fast. What that means is I have some small little bump in my DNA I want to detect. Well, I can't do so given my limited bandwidth. It just goes too quickly. The, 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 the label peaks is too attenuated by the filter. Um, another problem is I have a lot of folded translocation events. If I have a folded translocation, well, I can't get any information about it. I need linear to actually extract one-to-one -one correspondence between probe and sequence. What a remarkable thing is that about only 30%, a third of translocation events in a 10 nanometer pore are unfolded. Of course, I can actually use a smaller pore that suppresses folding, but then I don't have the advantage that I can look at larger analytes, I can't look at proteins. So it's a, quite problematic in this case. You need to avoid the folding. And the molecular fluctuations are very strong. There's a very, very broad distribution of translocation time for solid state pores. This creates a lot of noise on the termination of your probe positions. And finally, there's a much there's a subtle problem, um, and this is the problem of calibration, which people don't often think about. But pores get information in the time domain. I want to translate my time domain information to a sequence domain. How do I do that? Well, obviously, I need to measure the translocation velocity. That seems simple. I make some sort of reference sequence with probes at known locations. I run it through and measure the, 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 the measured times between probes. There, I can measure my velocity. Well, there's a problem. You can't assume the translocation velocity of molecules of different sizes is the same. The subtleties, for example, you have this tension propagation physics, so you can actually get a variable velocity in the translocation. And moreover, you're never going to be looking at samples with DNA of a single size. You're looking at fragmented gigapace pair genomes with lots of different sizes. So what I need is some way of performing in situ calibration for every molecule of varying sizes to actually extract the velocity in that molecule. How do I do this? So, well, one solution to this problem is this idea of using a two-pore device. Instead of one pore, I have two. And I have my molecule go simultaneously through both pores, like this. We were, um, the, 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 our collaboration wasn't the first uh, to develop such a dual pore. It was done initially, this is, a, I think, a Sergei Pruda Decker, a cat new. Um, but we, our group was the first to really solve all the problems on that list, I think, and make uh, So basically, why is a, a two-pore control method, why is it so important? Well. In a two-pore device, let's say I have independent control of the voltages at pore one and pore two. Um, the first implementation, by the way, wasn't independent. Just two pores is the same voltage. But if you have independent control of the voltage, that's really nice. Because what it means is that I decouple the translocation speed from the ionic flow, right? The ionic flow is given by the absolute voltage bias at the pores. But the translocation speed is given by the differential, the voltage differential between the pores. So in principle, I can have high signal imaging, really high voltage, but balance very closely at the pores so I get relatively slow. The second advantage is I can perform independent ionic sensing of probe one, probe two. If I have that capability, well then I can measure time of flight of a little pro probe running between probe one and probe two. From the time of flight of that probe and the distance between the pores, I can get that measure of the velocity. So I can actually get a local measure of velocity. 
So that's one of the reasons why dual port is kind of, has some nice properties. The dual port architecture we developed um, is based on basically sort of wafer scale approach. We have these, these microchannels etched in borosilicate silicate um, glass. Um, and, um, and we then bond a um, wafer with a silicon nitride membrane to that, 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 that wafer. And we remove the, the borosilicate. And then what we do is we punch pores at the apex of these two microchannels. And we put like a PDMS reservoir over that. So it, overall, it looks like this. You have a system with these two reservoirs, a DNA dangling between the pores. Um, and I think you see the connection between the, our, our, probe, our, our pore fabrication approach and this, this, this part of the talk. This is a reason why it's interesting to make more than one pore on the way, for example. Um, tip, we, we've currently been making these with FIB, but we have, we, we're now moving over into switching to, to TCLB in our groups. We can do TCLB pores in such a device now. And so, okay. So basically we imagine the, the spacing between these two guys um, note in our case is around um, half a micron, which is very long, actually. It's almost on order of, say, the radius of duration, something about lambda DNA. What this means is that it's rather difficult to trap a molecule in this special kind of Bohr state where the, where, the, where the opposite biases are applied. And we need a very special way of actually trapping the molecules. So what we do is we use something called active logic based on a field program. Or wait, wait, wait. It's just a chip. I can configure it. So if it takes in some sort of current input, it can then apply logic operations to, say, flip the voltages at the pores. And what we do is using the FPGA, we have this thing where, okay, we bring a molecule from the reservoir through the pore. We're, we're negative here, applying it to the pore. Well, the molecule passes that pore, it creates a blockade. Let's say 100 uh, picoamp um, 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 amplitude, 100 microsecond duration. Um, the FPGA detects that and it triggers the voltage at pore one here to, to go to zero. And what that does then is it arrests the translocation um, at this pore, and then pore two is bringing the DNA through. All right. Now, when the molecule goes through pore two, we get another um, blockade at pore two. In this case, we, in response to another 100 peak, peak, uh, uh, microsecond long, 100 picoamp um, blockade, then the FPGA says, okay, voltage at pore one, reverse. And what that does then is it traps a molecule in this tug of war state. And these things can last quite a long time here. And using this approach, we can get about 76% of events in the tug of war state even though the spacing between the pores is big. And what do we do with this? Well, there's some nice physics. What you can do is you, we keep the voltage at pore two fixed. We vary the voltage at pore one. And then we look at the actual mean duration of the tug of war states. And we get curves that look like this. When the voltage at pore one is low, it, we, the voltage at pore one, um, by the way, the voltage at pore two is 500 millivolts. So as the voltage at pore one approaches 500 millivolts, you, you, you basically slow, 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 slow down the translocation. You get this kind of like peak slow down and then the, the voltage at pore one grows the, and, and you, you see a fall off in the main duration. Well, what's going on here? Well, um, in this situation, on this side of the curve, the DNA is moving from pore one to pore two, like that. On this side of the curve, the DNA is moving from pore two to pore one. And we can prove that by just looking at exit probability. The probability the DNA exits from port two is 100% on this side, and it's 100% from port one on this side. And what happens here is evidently very special. In fact, we have an almost complete cancellation of the actual biases, and the actual escape process is driven purely by diffusion. I did a little bit of sort of anal physics work with this, and I found that the diffusion process is, is actually sub, is, um, is a sub diffusive process. So there's some interesting details there, but nonetheless, um, what we're not really interested in running devices at this point though, right? It's not useful to map probes by diffusion. I need a little bit of, of, sort of a little bit of bias to keep driving the DNA through. So what we typically do is we operate the chip with um, biases applied on either side of the actual resonance state, like here. And we flip between them to drive the DNA back and forth. So now, now we added tags based on monostrip avidin to the actual, and these are at, again, positions of a nicking enzyme. And the tags create these bumps, as I, I advertised, along the DNA blockade here. These are bumps due to the tag. And then what we can do is we can look at the, we can measure the time at, at the tag, measure its time to exit, the time from the tag, the time the DNA leaves up the dual pore. We can also measure the time of flight of the tag one, um, to, to, from, of the tag from pore one to pore two, for example. You can see there's a little bit of displacement between these two curves. These are the currents measured at pore one and pore two. And this displacement is just the actual time of flight. Well, if you look at the, um, the exit times, what we see is kind of, we look at we plot the exit times of pore one versus pore two, we get this nice linear correspondence. It's just telling us, yeah, both pores are seeing the same pattern of tags. As we hope that wasn't true, things would be really weird. Um, what's really interesting is that we can measure the pore to pore speed. 
just from the distance, as I, as, I, as I explained, just by taking the space between the pores and dividing by the time of flight to click on the pads. And this is what we get. We find um, about a 1.5 nanometer per microsecond speed. And this is done without, this is just in situ, right? I mentioned, okay, the next thing we did was with our labels, was we wanted a way to sort of continuously scan the DNA, not just wipe it through, but go back and forth, back and forth. And so we developed this approach where we imagine driving the DNA from pore one to pore two. Um, it has two labels on it. We call this left to right motion in this case. And we then count the number of tags as they pass through pore two. When the number of tags passes a certain preset number, which in this figure is two, then we reverse the bias. We tell the FPGA to reverse the bias. And it goes back. And then we repeat, cycle, and get multi-scanning. Multi this is what it looks like case of multi-scans. You might wonder, how many multi-scans can you actually generate with this approach? We've gotten hundreds. This is a, it doesn't fit on the slide. This is an example of around like 40. Well, it looks, I'm showing you the good examples, of course. What happens is there's a disengagement probability for every scan of about 10%. That leads to a Poisson statistics in the number of scans you can actually achieve. So these are good examples, but nonetheless, um, we can achieve a kind of multi-scanning and we can imagine approaches that might reduce this actual disengagement time. I mentioned that folding is a big problem in nanopore work. 30%, only 30% linear translocations of a 10 nanometer pore. Well, this technology fixes that problem completely. Folds can be identified just by the double you know, level in, in the blockade, which is a fold. Um, what we can do is we can look at the folds present in first scan, second scan, third scan, fourth, fourth scan. So this shows you is the probability of an unfolded translocation in single pore, 40%, as I claim, close to 30%. First scan, it bumps up to 70%. Second scan, 100% unfolded. And that's very important because I can use 100% of the events, right? I don't have to worry about folding. Why is this occurring? Well, it's arising because when I drive the molecule, um, you know, we imagine on the first scan, we drive a fold into the reservoir two, like that. And then we reverse the actual bias direction. Now, in this case, the, the force at port two is actually moving opposite the molecule's motion, right? That tends to yank out these folds at the point of the second scan. And we can use our ability to estimate velocity to actually obtain a measure a correspondence between the, the time domain and the, 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 the sequence domain. So an example of this, it shows a, a multi-scan with two tags. These are the tags, we extract their positions, they get that looks like this. Well, I can then measure the, the port to port speed V in the way I mentioned, D divided by just like the average time of flight over all the actual um, pro, um, label measurements. And then I just get the, the, the distance, right? Just D times time. And then I translate to uh, uh, sequence space or genomic distance space. I can basically move tag one here to just a zero because it's the same tag. I can always align the scan so that they're coincident. And then this basically shows you the distance between the two tags. I get scatter in the, of course, the second tag's measurement, but, and that's quite a large degree of scatter. I warned you that there's a lot of fluctuations in this technology, but I average, right? And in principle, you know, standard deviation of the mean, I can reduce the actual error on the sink by the number of measurements I get. So I can make a nice measure, precision measurement of tag space. There's some cute things with this. I, the algorithm is far from perfect. There'll often be false positives, false negatives. I'll miss tags, I'll get tags that aren't tags. Um, this is an example where, ooh, I'm scanning two tags. Ooh, I see a third, where did that come from? Okay, now I'm scanning two, I see a third. So what I did is I developed a way to realign this by finding the translational offset that would minimize the, basically the square difference between the, between the, the spacings on the different scans. And you can rearrange things to create, to rationalize the set in the following way. And that you see clearly here, I'm scanning one spacing, I dither to the adjacent spacing, and I dither back to, to, to the original spacing. So these errors in tag detection create a kind of stochasticity that creates a degree of dithering, which is, I think, not necessarily a problem because it allows you to, to scan a little bit further along the actual um, genome. Well, one thing you may be wondering is that, well, that's not so useful. I want to measure barcode. You're just showing me two different tags. Well, there's a way to solve this problem. How do I increase the scan region? A clever approach is to use a zoom approach where we gradually increase the number of tags passed um, by, by the actual um, port before we reverse it. And this shows you the example of the zoom scan. In this case, the tag counter is two, then three, then four, five, six. You zoom out and you can start seeing a much larger region of the barcode. And look at all the statistics that are actually arising here. Note that there's actually, if you squint at this, you'll see these really represent a similar genomic region in these, these two areas. I should, as a detail, I mentioned we switched over from protein labels to, to, to oligo overhangs, but it, the DNA um, tags interact a little bit less with the pore, so they, they work a bit 
us. We also developed a way to recapture as well as zoom in. So the recapture algorithm works this way. In this case, we're capturing the DNA from the Kamenin reservoir. Um, we basically drive into port two. Now we apply the protocol I mentioned to you earlier, where we form a tug of war in the usual way using FPGA. We, we bring it across. We form the, the tug of war state like this. Well, at some point, it's going to disengage, right? Okay, let's say it disengages into reservoir one. Well, at this point, what we do is we simply go back. We, we, we now um, we go to this point within the protocol and we reverse it and we run again. What if it disengages from reservoir two? Well, at this point in the protocol, we want to drive it to the common reservoir and then we go back to state one. So it's possible to actually create multiple recaptures as well as zoom scan. And this shows you four uh, recaptures from one molecule with zoom scan. So you can start developing a large degree of statistics from this technique. Now, at this point, well, getting a lot of statistics, getting this sort of weird pattern of tag, what do I do with it? Well, it's time to talk to the bioinformaticians at this point. They can help us develop algorithms for alignment. By the way, this is only port two. You also get information from port one. I'm only showing the LTR in this case. Um, well, how do I use this information? This was data taken from a Lambda DNA model. Lambda is kind of boring. It's just basically the, the biologist circular DNA. It's a joke, it's circular cow, right? It's a DNA standard. We all use in these experiments. Is, you can buy it cheaply at high concentration. And we created our reference map, by the way, uses two of these Nicky enzymes. That's the barcode we're looking at here. Um, and what, well, okay, so we have all these scans. We want to align that scan to the Lambda reference genome, you know, basically. The reference represents just a series of sort of label positions along, along the DNA, the known positions from the Nicky I want to align. Well, the first step is to break up my scans into individual pairs. And then I basically want to match pairs, measured pairs, to reference pairs. And what I do is I create a kind of scoring function, which basically finds pairs which match the best. And this is done basically just assuming you have a certain you know, you know, stretch factor, you have a certain Gaussian distribution given a certain um, pairing sequence that's known. And then the closer the, 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 the measured matches the sequence, the better the score. Um, so this shows you a number of scans um, that the thick barcodes represent scans where they match very well. The, the dashed lines represent where they don't match so well. But basically it shows the alignment of all these, these different scans to, 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 the, to the reference um, marks. And then, okay, so how do I, this is a little bit complicated. I want to summarize information in some way. So this nice tricks. Oh, by the way, I should mention that, how do you actually find the best position along the reference? Well, what you do is you kind of, you use a kind of very fancy approach called Smith-Waterman, sort of this bioinformatics apparatus, which basically enables you to take this local scoring function and use that local score to basically find the best position at which the, the scan fit. And it, it, it takes into account things like missing tags within the actual um, measurements. So once we've made these alignments, um, we basically, um, we then um, create a consensus and the consensus is done to sort of the following way. You imagine looking at a certain uh, pair spacing on the reference, you find all the, the, the actual experimental spacings which match that. Then you go to the next one and find experimental spacings which match. And you sort of work across from, from this vertex all the way to this vertex, aligning these guys to the reference. Now it's tricky because certain cases, they may not be unique. There may be cases where the spacing misses a tag. So therefore I can have different paths I can actually assemble. But what we do is you, you use your scoring function to, to apply a certain score for a given path. And you say the best path is the one we're going to pick. So this is actually the best path from all these spacings. And we represent this is our consensus from all these, these multi-scan. And we get a consensus from every recapture event. So this is for Lambda. And this shows you all 15 tags in the Lambda digest. That's working. Um, well, um, what about something useful? So we're now trying to do genome scaling. We're moving to E. coli, 4.6 megabase per genome. And we apply the same procedure. This shows you. This here um, represents a single molecule measured from E. coli. These are the four recaptures we got. Um, these are all scans from those recaptures. Many of them don't align, it's, they ran li randomly. But look, there's a hot spot here of, of, of many alignments and that's true through all the recaptures. So we can say, I think confidently that that, that little molecule we're imaging comes from this point on E. coli. So we can map it to this reference. Then we can look at those guys. We can, we can then look at all the scans which align at that point, And then we can create a consensus from that. And then basically scaling this, we've been able to map about 70%, I think 68% of E. coli. These all represent um, the, the consensus scans aligned. So indeed, it is possible to use this dual point technique to do a bit of genomics, to start aligning individual scans to, in this case, a moderate size genome, but one can imagine scaling it from you know, 4.6 megabase per to six gigabase, right? The human size. So it's, that's sort of, I think, feasible at this point. Nonetheless, this is preliminary. We didn't get 100%. Now, um, I have one more talk. I don't know 
people want the other top because things time is it's now 11. So maybe uh, maybe I can do a quick scan through it. Uh, okay, so Chris, this is okay. So I'm interested in this problem. This is gonna be a little quickie of looking at multiple polymers in the box. I have not one chain. I now have many chains. I have like a few, two, three, four in the box. I want to see how they interact. All righty. There's a lot of simulation in this problem, but no model experiments. Cool physics, right? Small disconnected particles mix. This entropy favors that. If I have connected chains and they intermingle, they segregate. It's not obvious, but entropy actually favors the mix of large polymer chains. Interesting thing that Sakajun um, actually pointed out about 10 years ago. Now, um, this leads to a kind of phase, kind of physics which is distinct from say liquid-liquid droplet formation, for example, because liquid-liquid phase transitions arise from little molecules interacting, so it arises from two big molecules interacting. But nonetheless, they have implications for biology. Um, for example, um, I wanna have bacteria divide, the, the DNA gets segregated to the daughter cells. What drives the segregation process? Well, Sakajin proposed it might have, be part due to this entropic kind of um, exclusion effects you get for large DNA. A, a more recent problem, which is very interesting, bacteria also have plasmids, little circular pieces of DNA that carry important things like, 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 like antibiotic resistance effects, for example. So they're really important to understand how the plasmids segregate as well. Um, plasmids present in the high copy number don't have an active mechanism for segregation. So therefore, how do they segregate? Well, kind of interesting. Biologists have done live cell imaging for how plasmids are distributed in bacteria. This is what one work of, of um, a colleague, Reyes, um, biology did. And when he found that the plasmids like to segregate at the poles of the cell. That's a little weird. Why does it happen? Well, people looked at higher resolution using super resolution, and they found, oops, plasmids don't just segregate at the poles. They have this sort of ring-like conformation around the DNA, the nuclei it's in here. So molecule interaction, DNA interaction, can lead to organization, it seems. So I wanted to study this using um, basically advice that's developed inspired by a click approach developed in collaboration with Professor Leslie. We um, apply pressure to this membrane, we squeeze molecules from these cavities. And it just looks like this. It's a little thin flap on the check. apply pressure to push it down. Um, and I mentioned this is distinct from her very pioneering work studying liquid liquid phase. Because we're focusing on big multiple molecules, not interactions from small molecules. So um, this is what it looks like. Um, basically this movie, you see, this is lambda, labeled same molecule, labeled differentially. So we have red floor and green floor. Ooh, look at this case, there's two in a cavity, right? They interact in that cavity. Well, I can then in time, I can look at that. This shows you the two molecules interacting. Ooh, it's kind of cool. They actually segregate. There's kind of a Brownian rotation going around about these. But I think other cases are boring. Single molecule just bats about confusing a bit. This is kind of boring too, but this is a little cool. So what we did is we expanded the study by varying the anisotropy of the cavity, making circles which, which grow increasingly more elliptical. And this is what we got. You see, you get this sort of Brownian motion in the circle as we saw before, but as you make them more anisotropic, well, they segregate, right? You go to this motion where red just occupies one side of the cell, but they can also flip polarity, right? So we get a kind of polarization of the actual DNA. And we can quantify that by, um, this is really speed, I know. We can quantify that by looking at the, the, the vector position between the center of, of mass of these two, these two coils. And you get a donut in a circle, it makes the cavity elongated, and we get an elliptic. You see this symmetry breaking effect. Right. I think it's a little obvious. I think it's cool, but kind of obvious too. So I, I mix the feelings about this. But what happens if I add, I'm not going to skip dynamics. What happens if I add a plasmid? I have plasmid and big molecule. Well, this is really things get interesting because what you see here, look at this. The plasmid is sitting on the edge. It's excluded by the big molecule. Look at this. The plasmid seems to like to hang out at the poles maybe as it gets elongated. Well, is it really true? Here's a histogram. Well, plasmid, this is the plasmid position. It's a ring. Ooh, looks like a bit of the poles. Ooh, looks like a bit of the poles. It's a ring. We're seeing, we resemble, if I can be very careful about this, observations seen in the EVO, in vivo system. But it's a trivial system just containing one big T4 and a plasma. So but I think it's kind of interesting. The point, and we found that we have this little theory basically where you have a boundary potential, you have a smooth volume potential, and there's the competition between those two just creates a pocket at the edge. I'm um, speed through this. It's really simple, but nonetheless, it suggests Generic polymer interactions might explain this rather non-trivial biological fact. Right, so that's the end. Um, quick summary, tip control. This is by, I shouldn't have, this is worked on most of a uni, who's now at BMI. Um, this is dual poor, um, with Xavier on, as well as uni as well started this collaboration with, with the NUMA team. And the DNA box work was, was, was usually up. So um, if there's a bit of philosophy about this, biologists always complain. Oh, this can't be true. The, the cell is much more complicated. Molecular crowding, many active mechanisms. I see absolutely <laughs> perfect agreement. But as a physicist, I'm interested in simple models. I want to understand the basic soft matter physics that can potentially 
unexplained biology. Even if the soft matter physics is not correct, you have these other reasons, the soft matter physics creates a reference, a kind of background on top of which the active mechanisms arise. The active mechanisms can compete with that background and sometimes they get promoted by it. So you have to understand the basic soft matter physics before you can understand why the active mechanisms exist in the first place. That's philosophy, but nonetheless, I feel that deeply. So thank you for all the technical difficulties.